It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. to introduce the first of our three strikers from Wolverhampton Wanderers this afternoon. Uh, this is the youngest of the three. Uh, I don't think I'm being rude to the other two. Uh, I once compared him to, the, to, to be the Jack Wilshire of the WFA. I'm not sure after England's performance in the World Cup whether that's particularly flattering anymore. But uh, anyway, uh, the future of First World War history and... Uh, and of the WFA is in particularly good hands in the hands of people like Spencer Jones. A um, couple of excellent publications in recent years, his study of uh, tactical reform in the British Army between the Boer War and the First World War, and a book, you, if you haven't already got it, you can buy today, Stemming the Tide, a study of command and leadership in the BEF in 1914. And being young and energetic, he's got a a book on 1915 in preparation now, so uh, uh, makes me feel tired just thinking of that sort of output. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, Spencer Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Now, this is my second time here at the WFA President's Conference, second in a row, and it's the second time I've been given a graveyard slot. <laughs> After lunch, Last year, I was actually the very last slot, so if you see my eyes drooping and getting a bit tired and, and fading away, just somebody come and give me a poke. Now, this morning we heard a lot about the German army, big operations, command issues, the general staff, the bigger picture of war, what the German army seems to do so well. I'm going to take it down to a much lower level today, down to the, the, the worm's eye view of the campaign because this was very much how the British Expeditionary Force of 1914 saw the campaign in France and Belgium. When I started working on 1914 as a topic in going back a number of years, in 2006, England weren't much good in that World Cup either. In 2006, I was the, just about the only academic who was working on the British Army in 1914 at the time. And it was scary in some senses because I had no one to ask for advice. But it was exciting too because there was no one to contradict me. Now, in the last two or three years, there's been a wave of what I'll call revisionist academia about the BEF that has challenged the view that it was a, a pretty effective fighting force, that it performed well, that it was tactically skilled. And if you were to take the summary of the current literature on the BEF in 1914, you'd be forgiven for wondering how we ever got across the channel. I actually think some of the revisionism has, has gone far, much too far. Um, some of it is, is worthwhile and good, but I also think some of it is revisionism for revisionists' sake. And I think there's almost an, uh, an element of transposing the donkey's myth of 1915 to 1918. Well, we've spent years fighting that, and it's just, been, just about been disproved now. And transposing it to 1914 and saying, well, the British Army was absolutely terrible in 1914, it was lucky to survive, um, it achieved nothing in the campaign, and it was thoroughly thumped whenever it came into contact with the German Army. But as we've seen this morning, the German Army itself was not this monolithically effective institution that some historians would have us to believe. And neither was the BEF. There's this idea that the BEF was tactically elite, well, it certainly regarded itself uh, as tactically elite, but even the most elite armies, the most effective institutions, have an ideal that's aimed at. And not everybody within that institution will reach that level. It's very much the, um, uh, the, the goal to be aimed at, but it isn't always achieved. But what the BF was good at, and what I'm going to explore today in this talk, was the art of leadership. And in my opinion, it was the leadership of the BF that held it together, um, particularly on the Great Retreat, but also at First Ypres later in 1914. And before we can go into how this worked, why the BF was good at leadership, why it was effective, 
we need to provide some definitions. I was taught when I was a, a young whippersnapper, some would say I still am a young whippersnapper, a few grey hairs now, um, that the best way to provide definitions is to steal what clever people have already said on the topic. So, with that in mind, the definition of command I'm going to use is by a very clever person, <laughs> Professor Gary Sheffield, who provided this very neat and also, in my opinion, accurate definition of command. Can you remember writing this, Gary? I nicked it from John Pimlock. <laughs> there we go. All the best ideas come from other historians. <laughs> but to return to the, the task at hand, command as a managerial function, the bigger picture, the direction, coordination and effective use of military force. And I would say it's those issues that we've been looking at this morning. But these issues in some ways were less important to the BEF in 1914 than this other important related element to uh, command, and that's leadership. And again, I've stolen it from another clever person, Sir Michael Howard, who wrote, the capacity to inspire and motivate, to persuade people willingly to endure hardships, usually prolonged, and incur dangers, usually acute. It is essential at lower levels of command. As you can see, these two factors, command and leadership, are very closely related, but they're also very much distinct. Command the overall direction, the managerial element of the war, um, leadership, the front line, the tactical problems, the simple problems of how do you make a platoon of bone-tired, dispirited men move? How do you make a group of frightened young soldiers attack into enemy fire? The nuts and bolts of tactical combat. And this is what the BEF of 1914 was strong at. Not necessarily command, but certainly leadership. And as we'll see, it was leadership that would hold the army together. Why was the BF talented in this particular field? Well, there are a number of reasons why it took this approach to war. And perhaps the simplest was the nature of what the army was required to do. As I've said before, and as I'm sure you're familiar with from my from, uh, work on this subject, the BF, even in August 1914, was essentially a colonial army. <clears throat> it was a true expeditionary force. So those stationed in the United Kingdom, it had a global remit for where it might be deployed. It was a troubleshooting force. It could be deployed almost anywhere around the empire at relatively short notice. And it could be deployed in strength, that is the full six divisions plus the cavalry division, or it might be deployed in segments, perhaps a single division, perhaps a single corps, maybe even a brigade or two if necessary. The size of the army six divisions, bore no particular relation to any military problem. As Henry Wilson was fond of saying, there is no problem in military science to which the answer is six divisions. It was a political and financial decision to make the army this size, and it had never been revoked. It had been originally introduced in the 1880s, and it remained that way in 1914. It was a small army, therefore, with a wide uh, potential array of operational zones, not to mention the possibility of deploying to France and Belgium uh, in alliance with the French and in resistance to any German invasion. Because it was small, it tended to spend less time thinking about the big command uh, managerial problems of the war. The higher organisation of the army was comparatively neglected. We can perhaps criticise the army for this, but I think in some ways this is unfair. The general staff... Um, we had been founded in the aftermath of the Boer War. It had had teething problems, as all new organisations such as these have. It was not truly effective, um, probably until 1912, at the earliest, and there are questions about its effectiveness even then. To the army, the general staff was simply another war office institution. The idea that the general staff would become a blue ribbon for the rest of the army, that it would provide central direction and planning, hadn't really been realised by 1914, although it would develop as the war went on. Equally, Staff College and the Magic Three initials, PSC, passed Staff College as a marker of military talent, although it was becoming established by 1914, had by no means become definitive at this time. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, further to this, the way that the army was stationed in 1914, stationed in the UK, meant that corps were not formally organised. First corps being the exception, based at Aldershot out of 1st and 2nd divisions. But 2nd corps existed only on paper, and 3rd corps had barely been thought about. Furthermore, the divisions, apart from those in Aldershot, were scattered around the country, and the effectiveness 
with which they could train varied wildly. For example, 6th um, Division stationed in Ireland had various problems because it was spending so much time in police duties due to the troubles in Ireland that it had little time for large scale training. Whereas 4th Division, which was scattered along the east and southeast coast, was so divided it found difficulty getting together for divisional manoeuvres. And indeed, lack of manoeuvres is something that um, rather defined the BEF prior to the First World War. Manoeuvres had only been reintroduced into the British Army uh, in 1898, a year before the Boer War. They'd been disrupted by that war, reintroduced in 1903, and had continued annually up until the outbreak of war. But that only gives the Army ten years in which to conduct large-scale manoeuvres. It had to learn how to conduct manoeuvres as it went along. And its manoeuvres were hampered by two factors so common to the British military, time and money, both of which were in short supply. The army was getting better at manoeuvres throughout this period, particularly from 1907 onwards when it became more organised in how it approached them. But it was still learning and the manoeuvres it did carry out varied enormously in scale, practicality and usefulness. The actual value which the senior officers of the BEF in 14 drew from these manoeuvres remains a subject of debate. And there's a, another interesting research topic. What did the senior commanders actually learn from their manoeuvres, if anything? Certainly, um, th there's some evidence that many of the problems that were encountered in 14 had been encountered in manoeuvres beforehand, but to the extent to which the lessons were absorbed remains a subject for debate. But in the absence of success um, and, and ability at command level, the BEF substituted quality at a lower level, particularly uh, amongst the battalion, the battalion that the glue that binds the British Army together in many ways. And Battalion level training throughout this period, although we can find examples where it was hampered or where it was less effective, was by and large good. The battalion CO had some degree of autonomy about how he trained his battalion, and it seems that most battalion COs were very positive on what they did. They were keen on the, uh, keen on the work, they pushed their troops well, and they were pretty effective in this sense. And battalions, once they were grouped in brigades, also seem to prove effective, and the Inspector General's reports prior to the war are generally positive about brigade-level training. But as you got higher in the ranks, into division, into corps, this is when the problems uh, begin to uh, uh, appear. But to return to this idea of leadership, one of the ideas, that, one of the reasons that the battalions were the heart of British leadership was the sheer extent of combat experience that the COs possessed. And in 1914, uh, at the outbreak of war, out of 157 infantry battalions, their COs, the COs of 138, had some form of active service. The majority had seen active service in the Boer War, which was a, a reasonable approximation of modern battlefield conditions. Others had seen service in India, Afghanistan, the Northwest Frontier, or, or other parts of the globe. Now, we can say, well, what possible use was combat experience in a colonial war for the kind of combat that would be thrust on the army in 14? Well, the skills of leadership, uh, leadership under fire, are fairly universal. The ability to stay calm under fire, the ability to control your own fear, the ability to inspire your men, the ability to make quick and, indeed, informed decisions in action. These are the essential ingredients of command leadership. And... The officers who had this combat experience, although this isn't necessarily a direct correlation with European war, they had, by and large, proven themselves reasonably effective, and in some cases very effective, at a level of combat in the colonial actions. I should add as well that company commanders, the, the next level down, also had a degree of combat experience. I don't have the figures exactly. Uh, and so did NCOs. There was a good smattering of combat-hardened sergeants throughout the lower ranks of the British Army. The Army was confident in its leadership capabilities. While it was striving very hard to try and improve its command arrangements through things like the General Staff, through things like annual manoeuvres, it was confident in how its Army approached leadership. One of the great lessons of the Boer War was that you needed a lot more than just drill and obedience in your junior officers. If your junior officer was given a, a command, um, and followed it through, and it led the army into disaster, that wasn't effective. In the Boer War, it had been found repeatedly that officers, junior officers, were so afraid of responsibility, were so afraid of making a mistake, that they would just blindly follow orders 
even if it meant leading their troops into disasters or leading them into difficult situations. The experience of combat broke down those attitudes in the Boer War, and after the conflict had finished, the army was very keen, I know sorry, the army was very keen to establish this in written format. It did so in a gentle way in combined training 1905. It took a much more strident line in field service regulations 1909, which enshrined the authority of the man on the spot. And the wording's quite interesting. Effectively, as the man on the spot, you have authority to disobey a direct order from a superior if you feel that superior's order does not reflect the situation that you are facing. And this was an attempt by the army to allow more dynamic leadership. They, an appreciation that orders coming from a higher command might be outdated by the time they reach the front line or might not reflect what is happening on the front. From 1909 onwards, it was enshrined in regulation that junior officers could take charge, could actually seize the moment and command, uh, sorry, or lead as they saw fit. And the army's ability to put this into, into code reflected this confidence in its leadership. It knew that its junior officers would carry the day if necessary. And it was important that the army had these good leaders in 1914. I'm not going to give a, um, a rundown of the campaign. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But it's worth reminding ourselves of the challenges that the British army faced in 1914. There's an awful lot being written recently to point out that the BS contribution in 1914 was relatively small. Well, in fact, it was very small compared to the French contribution. And that's true. I won't really be mentioning the French in this talk. I don't want to denigrate their contribution. But the focus is on the British Army in this position. The first thing to bear in mind is that, as we heard this morning, the Germans were unsure where the British were. The British were also unsure where the Germans were. They knew they were moving through Belgium. The extent, uh, the extent of the German strength, the extent of the direction of the German attack was or it seems to have been largely unknown at G British GHQ, although information was repeatedly coming in from both the RFC and also the British cavalry screen, that a very formidable German hook was coming in onto the British line. But by accident, um, fortuitous accident, if you will, or uh, perhaps less fortuitous, the British army found itself in the path of von Kluck's first army as it wheeled through Belgium. And by being placed on the far left of the French line, the BF actually found itself in not necessarily the, the truly decisive theatre, it certainly found itself in the pulpit of the campaign, alongside Lanrazak's 5th Army on its right, facing the main hook of the German Schlieffland plan. These early encounters with the German army were bruising for the BEF. The BEF's tactics were good, training was solid, its weapon systems were reasonably effective, but as is the case in any war, no matter how well prepared an army may appear, at the outset, there will always be the unexpected surprise that it encounters during its first clashes. The Germans had a number of unpleasant surprises for the British Army. Two in particular I'd like to mention, machine guns and artillery. Both of these weapon systems have been um, only loosely employed by the Boers in South Africa. Suddenly facing mass machine gun fire and also artillery bombardments of the like of which the British Army had never faced created problems for the British Army. And for example, one of the treasured ideas that had grown from the Boer War was citing your uh, British trenches with the best possible field of fire. There was a, a, perhaps an overbelief in the effectiveness of, of just hastily dug trenches to protect against artillery fire. This, of course, put the British trenches in full view of German artillery and brought down a storm of fire onto them. And indeed, British troops, 7th Division, which came out later in the campaign, repeated this mistake uh, at Ypres with tragic consequences. The other divisions had learnt from them as th their, their punishment they had received in the August and September battles. But the keynote was adapt or die for the British Army. It had to move, it had to be flexible, it had to react quickly to this new and dangerous threat. And I'm quite happy to take questions about BF tactical effectiveness or otherwise afterwards. But regardless, the BF did some things very well in August, September 14. Other things it had to change very quickly and it had to learn on the spot um, and it had to adapt or literally uh, be swept away by the pace of the German invasion. The other um, adaptation that was required was the campaign did not proceed necessarily as the British expected. It's difficult to determine exactly what the British expected the campaign to proceed like. A general advance alongside French forces into Belgium, but the, what the culmination point would be is unclear. Was Belgium to be liberated? Was the advance to carry on into Germany? Who knows? 
course, events in the campaign meant that question was essentially academic. But what was clear um, was that the British Army was going to be forced into a very precipitate retreat very quickly. Interestingly enough, senior officers, William Robertson, Douglas Haig, Horace Smith Dorian, Thomas Snow, had all considered the possibility of a retreat as an opening move in this campaign prior to the war. Alma Haldane, a brigadier in Thomas Snow's 4th Division, had actually undertaken a cycling tour in early 14 uh, of John Moore's route on the retreat to Corunna in Spain to give him some impression of how a retreat would undertake. And he wrote in his memoirs, A Brigade of the Old Army, that having gone on this cycling tour gave him great confidence in August 1914 because he felt the BEF's challenges were nowhere near the challenges that um, John Moore had faced in Spain almost a century earlier. But other officers, Haig, who I won't say too much about, as I know there's a paper on him coming up, Smith Dorian and Robertson had also considered there was a strong chance that in the opening moves of the campaign, the British Army might be forced to retreat at pace, possibly even evacuate from the continent uh, to return. This was much in keeping with earlier campaigns uh, in the Peninsular War, for example, and in the Napoleonic Wars. There was a tradition that the opening campaigns of the British Army tended to misfire. So there was some thinking about this, but as it panned out, the actual pace of the retreat, the dangers of the retreat, and the pressure of the retreat were more than expected. And against both German expectations and, uh, to some extent, British expectations, the British Army did not bolt for the Channel ports. It actually retreated south in conformity with the French army and remained in the line. The pace of the campaign is something we need to emphasise. We've already heard how the pace exhausted German reservists. Um, and they had the advantage, of course, if they fell behind, they could... Uh, they were behind friendly lines, they could catch up. The trials of British reservists on the Great Retreat are well known. Um, and the image of the Great Retreat, there's some wonderful anecdotes about troops you know, walking on. They've cut the sleeves off their shirts, they've got huge beards. People walking on barefoot with rags wrapped around their feet because their boots aren't broken in. But the pace of the retreat was immense. Um, and the, the heat of August was, was tropical in many ways, absolutely exhausting. What's striking is how fast the BEF marches. Even with reservists and more, the fastest pace I've found is the first Cameron Highlanders goes 35 miles on August the 27th um, in, in scorching heat. On the 25th, a number of battalions of 2nd Corps do 30 miles in a single day, and then, of course, they're required to fight the Battle of Le Cateau the following day. And on top of this, there's very little sleep, particularly for officers who are... You know, awake through the night, handling orders, receiving things. Staff officers in particular are, are surviving on perhaps two or three hours of sleep a night. And of course, this causes casualties. Um, perhaps the most famous of all is James Edmonds, who has something akin to a nervous breakdown. He attributes it to the fact he's, he, he can either survive, he writes in his memoirs, I can cope on no sleep and I can cope on no food. I can't cope on both at the same time. Supply arrangements in the, the Great Retreat um, seem to work relatively well. The stockpiled food of William Robertson's uh, quartermaster department seems to provide for the army as it moves past. But for staff officers who have very little opportunity to take a break, uh, they seem to be particularly poorly fed. So you've got this huge pressure. No time to rest. No time to gather your wits. Constant marching in blistering heat and lack of sleep at the end of it. There's also a sense of chaos a sense of uncertainty, and reading memoirs and reading the fabulous reminiscences that are in the Cab 45 files and in the National Archives about what it was like on the retreat. This is officers writing to Edmonds after the war. There's a huge emphasis on we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was going on. There were wild rumours, um, the most famous of which perhaps the Angel of Mons and ghostly sightings on the retreat. But there were others that were almost as fantastical. The idea that an entire Russian uh, corps had been landed in Scotland with snow on their boots and were going to deploy somewhere on the coast. That was apparently went as high up in the ranks as 2nd Division commanders Charles Munro, who related it to some of his troops, uh, apparently. There were also other rumours about huge columns moving through the night, whether they were German or French. Rumours about um, Germans disguised as Frenchmen with machine guns on cars driving behind British lines and shooting up supply trains. Anything you can imagine. Partially this was a result of sleeplessness and exhaustion. Partially a result of, a communica of, of problems with communications. We've seen the lack of lateral communication in the German army in 1914. There was very little lateral communication between 1st and 2nd Corps in 1914. There was also little communication between GHQ and 1st and 2nd Corps in 1914. The BF 
in the absence of strong telephone lines, had to use civilian telephones where possible. It lost a lot of wire that had been rolled forward in the advance and then had to be very quickly abandoned during the retreat. And it was largely reliant on dispatch riders, either on motorcycles or on horseback, to carry information from unit to unit. With the inevitability that orders became indecipherable, that they became outdated, and that there was a sense of, we do not know what is happening. And all this contributed to very, very dense fog of war, and also friction of war. And most of the problems, most of the miniature disasters that before the BF on the Great Retreat, the loss of the Cheshires at Audrenyes, the loss of the Munsters at Etreux, can be attributed to communication breakdown in one form or another. Um, perhaps the, the, the best example of that kind of communication breakdown is the failure of the Cheshires to withdraw at Audrenyes, despite uh, Colonel Ballard of the Norfolk sending three runners by three different routes to carry the withdrawal order to the Cheshires, all three runners become casualties and the Cheshires are left behind and are, are cut off and are, are effectively annihilated. <coughs> the friction of war apparent in that and the fog of war, the uncertainty of what is happening and this extends across the army. John French is unsure of the state of his allies, all he can hear is disastrous news from the front. He's unsure of the state of Second Corps, especially after Lakato. It seems to have been given a very rough handling. It seems to be in some disarray. He's worried it's, it's collapsing. He's got contradictory messages um, from Kitchener about, well, you've got to do the best to help the French, but you've got to save the army. So he's under immense pressure. He's uncertain. And that uncertainty filters down to the bottom of the army. And you get different examples. You find some battalion COs who are unsure why the army is retreating because they feel they're doing well. Some battalions haven't fired a shot. Some battalions don't fire a shot in anger during the entirety of the Great Retreat, where there's others that have been in truly ferocious combat and are reduced to skeleton formations. Um, in some cases, their units are separated, platoons are, are joining other battalions, and every single stray platoon or stray individual that joins another unit always reports that their parent unit has been annihilated. And so you've got this huge circle of misinformation uh, down at battalion level and a sense of disorganisation. Uh, GHQ, for various reasons, becomes dislocated, not only from 1st uh, and 2nd Corps, particularly 2nd Corps, but also from the French army. There is not a, a great deal of, of cooperation uh, in the early stages of the campaign. John French's dislike of, of Charles Lanrezac, commanding French 5th Army, and indeed vice versa, is well known. The two could not get on. Lanrezac also couldn't get on with Joffrey for that matter. But GHQ is in some ways operating in a vacuum. It knows the campaign is falling apart. It knows this is not how it was supposed to be, that the French are in retreat everywhere, that the Germans seem to be gaining ground everywhere, that, that First and Second Corps have become separated, that Second Corps might have been destroyed. Constant confusion. And in all this confusion, GHQ really loses control of the army in, in a lot of ways. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a personal failure. I think it's as much a systems failure, that the, just the pace of the campaign on a rudimentary organisation like GHQ was in 1914. And the unfortunate Sir John French, who's made a scapegoat for this, but he's actually a man who is surrounded by officers who all seem to have it in for him uh, and are determined not to help him, puts him in a very difficult position. What all this adds up to is there is a potential here for a military disaster of the very first order. You have a small army confronted by a far larger army, von Kluck's army, uh, outnumbers the BEF by about three to one. <coughs> You've got unreliable allies. There's little communication between the French and the British. You've got a precipitate retreat. You've got the army disintegrating, you've got communications breaking down, and you've got a pressing enemy close behind you. As one of the Captain Lomax, the Grindair Guard, says, they seem pushing devils, these Germans, because all he can hear as he marches is constant gunfire in the rear areas. There's potential here for the army to do two things. One, to disintegrate due to lack of guidance. Secondly, to be caught and to be destroyed uh, by the German army. And these are quite, although we're looking at these with hindsight, and we think, well, it all worked out okay in the end. This is not apparent in August 1914. The dangers are extremely real, and the complete destruction of the BEF in 1914 would have consequences which we can only guess at, but would certainly have been detrimental for the Allied cause. But the army wasn't destroyed. It not only survived, but it also played a role in the Allied success in 1914, both at the Battle of the Marne and then by virtue of surviving at the Battle of Ypres in the autumn. Why did it survive? Why, given all these problems, did it survive? 
Well, the key answer is actually leadership, in my opinion. But leadership benefits from the troops you command. And to take a quote from Michael Howard once again here, the BEF had high-quality troops. We can um, talk at length about how high-quality they were, whether they were the very tough, long-service professionals um, that the Germans and, indeed, the French imagined them to be, or whether they were the relatively inexperienced recent volunteers that the um, statistics tell the story of, and whether the, the implications for quality we can discuss. But what seems to be true is that tr the troops generally held together remarkably well. And when you did have officers who were um, perhaps falling apart, were, were injured, were killed, were suffering from ill health, were not coping with the demands of the retreat, generally the troops could, could make up for this. As Michael Howard's quote states, like well-trained horses, they can carry even indifferent and incompetent riders. Now, of course, there are examples uh, of the opposite of this, the most famous of which is the surrender of the colonels at San Quentin. But what's interesting about that surrender is that after the two colonels, Elkington and Mainwaring, have actually given up, um, Tom Bridges, Major Tom Bridges, the 4th Dragoon Guards, appears and he's able to rally the troops himself through his famous improvised marching band uh, and his rendition of the British Grenadier in Tipperary. And he's able to lead the troops away. The troops, even as exhausted and perhaps dispirited as they are, they respond to uh, a junior officer. Remember, there's two battalions here and he's only a major uh, from the cavalry. They respond to his call and they're taken away. Where there's other examples of comparative sort of um, or battalions breaking down. A, a good example is Montgomery, Vern, Lieutenant Vernon Montgomery's battalion, the Warwicks, badly cut up at Lakato, partially fragments during the retreat from Lakato, and Montgomery uh, and a group of others are actually separated because the Warwicks surrender at St. Quentin, but then a rally. Montgomery's not there. He's actually in a group of stragglers who are, who are some distance behind and are zigzagging across country in an attempt to rejoin the main army. Of course, Montgomery makes it. What's interesting is that this group of stragglers is led by a lieutenant, uh, not Montgomery himself, but another officer. Um, and these, what happens is men simply congregate onto officers. If they can't find officers, they'll congregate onto NCOs. Um, a good example of a very junior NCO taking charge of a group here is Corporal John Lucy of the Royal Irish Rifles. And his memoir, There's a Devil in a Drum, talks at length about his role leading a group of very tired Irish soldiers during the retreat. And though there's hints of indiscipline, at one point uh, a soldier apparently points a rifle at him and there's a, a tension, a tense moment, but it passes. These troops respond to their leaders and keep going even in difficult circumstances. Yes, there are those who fall behind. The straggling rate is high. But if we're talking in broad terms, the majority, the vast majority of the army gets away on the Great Retreat. And this is because of this unsung leadership from junior officers and NCOs. Now, if we go back to the Cab 45 files, the 194 to 199 series, which are reminiscences of the Great Retreat, and uh, Edmund's asking people questions about the Great Retreat, you can read it and you can, there is a sense that every officer who survived, who writes in, is very keen to stress nobody was straggling from his battalion. Now, of course, this isn't the case. There were straggling in even elite battalions, um, you know, the guards and so forth. But the fact that um, you're going to lose some stragglers in a manoeuvre like this was almost inevitable. What's interesting is that the entire army didn't break down. It was held together um, by, these junior, by this leadership of junior officers and NCOs. And particularly, remember that after Lakato, especially, the 2nd Corps is very disorganised and you have groups of soldiers from many different battalions and companies simply gathering around strong-willed officers who move, keep them moving and keep them organised and keep them as some kind of coherent unit. And it's remarkable how quickly 2nd Corps shakes back into a fighting order after Lakato. And partially this is due to this leadership. <clears throat> in general terms, the idea of the man on the spot proved its worth. Um, there was one example early in the war where a guards captain, I think he was a captain, might have been a colonel, just forget, um, disobeyed an order at Mons and was actually relieved of his command for it, but he was reinstated uh, on the grounds that he was actually acting within regulations very shortly afterwards. Aside from that, the authority of the man on the spot worked. Battalion COs had the opportunity to change orders to make decisions as and, when, um, as and when they saw fit. Of course, there was friction, and of course, there were um, you know, the potential for disasters. We've already discussed the Cheshires, and we can add the Munsters at Etro uh, on the 27th to that list. There were other instances, too, where the, uh, where the authority of the man on the spot perhaps could have been better exercised. But to pick out these kind of incidents 
and use them as a stick with which to beat the BEF is unfair. These were essentially atypical. The other factor was the stubborn valour that was provided by the battalion system. Field Marshal Bill Slim, commander of command 14th Army in Burma in the Second World War, commented about the resilience. He wasn't on the Great Retreat, but he studied it. He commented about the resilience of the BF on the Great Retreat, and he attributed it to the stubborn valour that the battalion system inculcated. Men who'd become deeply separated from their parent unit could still gravitate to soldiers who'd been part of that unit as well. The bonds of loyalty forged by the cap badge would hold small groups together. Um, and when stragglers formed these ad hoc groups, or phantom brigades as they were known in the language of the time, they were automatically, or, or at least in many cases, they were automatically subdivided based on what battalion each group of stragglers was from. So you might have a, a loose company of perhaps 50 men, 10 men each, um, for five, five groups of 10 men from different battalions. They would each function as their own miniature unit. And this was the, the stubborn loyalty of the battalion system. And indeed, officers' pride that their battalion would not be seen to collapse, that this would not happen in the ranks of an insert famous battalion here, there will be no struggling here, is very uh, apparent in both diaries, letters and memoirs. A great example is Major Mar Jeffries of the Grenadier Guards, who is at pains to point out that the Grenadier Guards did not lose a man uh, during the, uh, the Great Retreat from struggling until almost the very end when somebody collapsed into the arms of a nurse uh, and then the, the medical officer ran over and basically the nurse collapsed into his arms as well. I should add that Jeffries, though, is very keen to point out every single example of Coldstream Guards uh, straggling or passing out or falling by the roadside at a great and wonderful length. But it's true. Um, the Bonds Battalion loyalty and Battalion Pride plays a big role in holding the army together. I criticised BF command arrangements at this point, but they did prove flexible on the Great Retreat. As GHQ lost control of its cause, its cause took on much of the load themselves. Smith Dorian's decision to stand and fight at Lakato, though it may have, uh, uh, yeah, it was proved correct in the end. Equally, um, we can argue, we can split hairs about whether Haig was right to commit First Corps alongside Lanrazac's Fifth Army at what would eventually be the Battle of Guise. And we can also discuss whether French was right to overrule Haig, uh, Haig's support for the French there. But these decisions ultimately played into the BF's hands. They ultimately worked uh, effectively. I should also add that the much maligned BF senior officers of 14, and as I say, there is this tendency now to criticise them in the same way that the so-called donkeys of 16 were criticised. Um, a recent book on the BF in 1914 paints Smith Dorian and bizarrely Charles Ferguson of 5th Division as virtual villains um, in the Great Retreat. Since he's criticised them for not commanding the army effectively. But as I've hopefully shown, the nature of the campaign made command very difficult. In its absence, and even the much maligned John French does this, the uh, commanders do what they know best. They lead. They get down to battalion level. They visit the troops. They go on the roadsides. They're there to try and inspire the men, to keep them moving. French likes to, in, in the vernacular of the day, get around his army and see what's happening and try and uh, see them, try and chivvy them along, try and provide an inspirational um, guidance for them. So does Haig, so does Smith Dorian. And we might be cynical about this and say, well, what possible use could a senior commander appearing on the roadside have? Well, uh, John Lucy, again, to return to his memoirs, he, rem he remembered, even the 1930s, the appearance of Smith Dorian on the roadside during the retreat. Uh, and the fact that Smith Dorian actually told the battalion, do not salute me, save your energy, which was a small gesture, but one that meant a lot to some very tired and weary troops. And the sight of senior officers down at, uh, at ground level, sharing in the difficulties of the retreat, you know, on dusty horses with dusty uniforms, was more of an inspiration than we might give credit for in our more cynical age, I think. There was also an element of luck, sheer luck. This, again, has recently been used as a great form of criticism for the BEF, which I think is, is somewhat unfair. Clausewitz's Trinity of Battle or Trinity of War had logic, violence and luck appearing in roughly equal measure. And to criticise an army for being lucky um, is not a especially valid criticism. There was also ill luck. Luck balances itself out. And for every piece of good luck the BF may have had, it would have its equal measure of bad luck. It's a neutral force. It's not something that we should use to criticise BF performance with. So in assessment, I think the best way to describe BF leadership in 1914 is actually to take a, a quote from a poem 
Kipling's famous poem, If, that if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you needed a, a, almost an epitaph for command and leadership on the Great Retreat in 1914, it would be Kipling's words, because this is what is happening. John French, whatever his limitations, is certainly a very brave man. Whether he loses his head or not is another discussion, but certainly his, his chief of staff, his sub-chief of staff, Henry Wilson, is certainly blaming He's losing his head and he's blaming it very much on French or, or on Archibald Murray, the other chief of staff. There's a lot of potential for recrimination, breakdown and confusion. Um, potential for pre-war cliques to suddenly come bubbling to the surface, for everyone to start blaming each other for the breakdown in, uh, in this situation. This actually comes much later in the Battle of the Memoirs, when there's much criticism of who did what on the Great Retreat and with what effect. But actually, on the retreat itself, whatever the limitations of GHQ and whatever the breakdowns of higher command, the army does hold itself together. Um, if, it, if anybody does lose their head, they regain it or somebody else steps in to take charge of that particular situation. And although this isn't universal, again, remember the army set an ideal and they strive to reach it, and not everybody will reach that ideal. Courage, calm and quick decision-making defines BEF leadership, not only um, on the Great Retreat, but also at the Battle of Ypres later in the same year. And... Yes, we can pick out examples where this ideal was not reached and the uh, colonel's surrender is always wheeled out to, as a criticism of BF uh, leadership in this period. There's other examples we could go into. But these are atypical events and they were just that. They did not occur regularly. They're interesting and they're discussed because they're so unusual. They're not the, 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 the norm for this. What is actually the norm is a great deal of unsung leadership from a variety of sources. Um, which holds the army together during some very difficult times. And I, again, I hesitate, or I want to stress that the Great Retreat is not seen as a great heroic manoeuvre by the BEF. The official history volume one is one of the most misunderstood, misquoted and never read books in British military historiography. Um, everybody quotes that Edmunds piece that appears on page 10 that the BF was incomparably the best trained, best equipped and best organised force that ever went forth to war. Everyone quotes that it's on page 10 of a 480-page book. Nobody reads any more than that. If you actually pick it up, go through the chapters and get to the stage that's the retrospect on the Great Retreat, it's not described as a great victory. It's not described as a victory. It's put in terms of a very professional performance by an army. It, it, Edmunds notes that the army did not disintegrate. Its discipline did not collapse. It held itself together in sufficient order that it was able to turn around at the, um, on the eve of the Battle of the Marne and play its role alongside its allies. It is not a triumphalist volume in the slightest. If you can draw one lesson from... Or one, or two, there's two ideas that are put forward in volume one. One is that GHQ did not perform effectively, and the second is that the army's professionalism made up for it. And we go back to that idea of high-quality troops who, like well-trained horses, can carry in different riders. But the official history also notes that there were limits to the BEF's sort of improvised nature of command and leadership. And uh, at the Battle of the Aisne, uh, from mid, sort of mid-September onwards, as the German defence line solidifies after the retreat from the Marne, the BEF does not have its finest hour. Indeed, the 13th of September 1914 is in some ways the blackest day of the BEF in terms of casualties and also in terms of battlefield performance. There's a great deal of courage in the attack. There's a distinct lack of organisation, and the BEF needs coordinated action at the Battle of the Aisne. It doesn't get it. What happens is that individual divisions, and even to an extent brigades, tend to advance piecemeal. They run into a very determined German defence. There's a lot of courage, a lot of determination to gain lodgments, but it exposes one of the limitations of this um, emphasis on leadership in the British Army. It is great for carrying you through chaotic defensive battles and difficult, demanding retreats, but when you need coordination on a much more larger scale, it somewhat comes unstuck. Two conclusions, then, to finish before our questions. I hope I've shown you this afternoon that if there was one piece of glue that held the BF together in 14, it was leadership. When command arrangements started to fail, and they were failing fairly rapidly into the campaign, that leadership system came in and it took its place. And a combination of high-quality junior officers, well-trained and responsive troops, just like the well-trained horse, they carried the BF senior commanders 
uh, through difficult times. But that is not to denigrate so much the BF senior, uh, senior leadership, because they did play a role, and a role that is sometimes overlooked, and I go back to the, the moral effect of seeing a field marshal, John French, alongside the road, giving you words of encouragement. Um, it's often said that the um, First World War generals are chateau generals, certainly not on the great retreat of 1914. But it came at a cost. Going back to the battalion COs, you remember that 138 out of 157 had some form of active service. Well, by the end of 1914, by the end of the retreat, the Battle of the Aisne, First Deep, particularly First Deep, which is a terrible harrowing of the British Army, there was a 58% attrition rate amongst battalion COs that had gone to war in 1914. Killed, wounded, missing, broken down, or sent home. Um, although the, the, that means that remainder was still in post and many went on to um, have su successful military careers, you can get some idea of that this leadership came at a cost. Uh, and the BEF, a small, um, precious asset in some ways, was put through a harrowing process in 1914, which in some ways would lay the groundwork for the problems it would encounter with what we term de-skilling in 1915, as the army both expanded rapidly and was b drawing upon a much smaller officer cadre than it had had in 1914. But this sacrifice was not in vain, because without this effort from BF uh, junior officers in particular, without this, uh, the, the heroic leadership that many demonstrated, the BF itself may well have disintegrated or even been destroyed in August, September 1914, with consequences that, although unimaginable, would certainly have been serious for the Allied cause. In summary, leadership is the key. Thank you very much. It's a long way to Cittarelli. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Cittarelli. To the sweetest girl I know.